morning, everyone. Call this uh, meeting to order. Uh, my name is Bill Edgar. I'm the uh, president of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board. I'd like to, on behalf of the board, on behalf of the council, Randy will be speaking in a minute, welcome everyone to this, uh, I believe, first joint meeting between the uh, State Flood Board and the um, Delta Stewardship Council. Um, we'd like to first of all thank the, uh, we're meeting of course in uh, City Hall over in West Sacramento and we'd like to thank uh, Mayor Chris Cabalden, the members of the City Council and the staff for accommodating our our needs. Uh, they've done that many times before in other meetings and we certainly appreciate their generosity for doing that. The first item on our agenda this morning is uh, welcome and introductions. Uh, I'm on IPA uh, at this time and after I make some opening remarks and establish a quorum for the flood board, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to Randy who will do the same for the council. Now proceeding with a review of the agenda, you'll see that um, uh, after Randy's items on item uh, 1B, uh, we'll proceed to item 2, which is a presentation by the uh, council staff regarding the latest developments and current status of the Delta investment strategy. Um, since this is a workshop, I would suggest that um, board members be encouraged to ask questions and comments uh, along as the presentation goes along and then at the end of each major item like number two and three we'll ask for comments from the public um, then we'll after presentation from two we'll go to three which is a presentation by Eric Butler from the flood board staff um, and it's regarding the adopted uh, guidance document addressing the uh, broad themes that were deemed important by the flood board and uh, this document was uh, prepared adopted and uh, sent to the uh, Delta Council for their review as they were preparing the Delta levy investment strategy and as it was being developed Well, maybe this will be better. Okay, much better. <laughs> okay, under item four, we'll have additional uh, questions for members of the public, and then under item five, we'll be taking a break. Item six and seven, uh, with the Flood Board and the Delta Council will be having a discussion and discuss possible next steps um, in the uh, process uh, including uh, possibly setting up a, a working group with two members of the board and two members of the council, uh, working on items of mutual interest with the possibility of bringing uh, future items back to the respective agencies for possible future action. The board has had some um, success with that kind of an approach with uh, the Delta uh, levy subvention program in which we're revising the guidelines uh, which are to be adopted uh, at our meeting in uh, August 26th, I believe. Under item eight, there'll be more public comment and then finally under item nine, we'll have adjournment and hopefully be uh, gone by around one o'clock. So at this time, I'd like to uh, call the roll for the flood board and establish whether or not we have a quorum to conduct our business and Leslie, would you please call the roll for the board? Thank you, Mr. President. Board Member Countryman? Present. Board Member Ramirez? Here. Secretary Dolan? Here. Vice President Suarez? Present. President Edgar? Here. We do have a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, I'll make some just opening remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Randy to uh, do the same for the flood board. Um, first and foremost, I would say that um, the California Water Action Plan is really the roadmap to put California on the path to uh, sustainable water management. 
it's the umbrella document, the policy document under which we're all operating. And there are several goals in the Water Action Plan, reliability, restoration, and resilience. And today we're going to focus on resilience. Uh, resilience of the flood protection system to withstand the inevitable unforeseen pressures of the coming in the coming decades, the coming uh, years, and so on. For more than a hundred years, uh, the state of California has taken the lead to on flood risk management in the Central Valley. And today, not only the the uh, is the flood system expected to protect uh, billions of property damage uh, and people from public from uh, flood risk, but it also facilitates the water supply system, hosts fertile agricultural and supplies food for the nation and the world, and as we discover more every day, offers a unique and indispensable riparian habitat for endangered and threatened species. The Central Valley Flood Protection Plan adopted by the board in June 2012 was due to be updated in 2017 set the framework for flood risk reduction. For the first time in a century, a collaboration of state, federal, and local stakeholders came together to uh, prepare a comprehensive plan for the Central Valley Flood Risk Reduction System. Prior to that, and in response to a devastation caused by flooding in New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, Californians recognized that uh, New after New Orleans, uh, the Sacramento area is the greatest, has the greatest risk of lo flooding, loss of life and property uh, in the nation at this point. Through a series of bonds and with significant federal and local participation, dozens of projects have already been built and programs have been implemented to increase the level of protection for all residents, businesses, and visitors. We are making, I think, significant progress, but there's still much more to be done. At the base of the system, right before the floodwaters reached San Francisco Bay, they passed through the Delta and thus the board, along with 200 different public agencies and stakeholders have an interest in the Delta. According to a report commissioned by the National the California Natural Resources Agency and the U.S. Department of Interior, the Delta poses an impossibly complex problems. I believe the term uh, by the scientific authors uh, of that report was uh, devilishly wicked. As two of the agencies with interest and authority in the Delta, I'm pleased to be here and join with my fellow board members and the members of the staff in the Delta Stewardship Council to discuss a piece of that devilish wicked problem, the Delta levees, and prioritizing the state's investment in these levees. As you will hear in a few minutes from uh, Chairman Randy Fioroni, the Delta Stewardship Council has been given the task of recommending a priority for state investments in the Delta levees in order to advance the co-equal goal set forth in the Delta Reform Act. This joint workshop advances the goal of the board to enter into new partnerships with other agencies to form an alliance to facilitate collaboration and to strategize and obtain the broad public values outlined in the Water Action Plan, such as economic stability, eco ecosystem vitality, and recreational opportunities in addition to the highest flood protection possible. There is a need for new and innovative solutions to operate and maintain the levees. With the uncertainty of climate change, with less snow, more rain, and the possibility of extreme climate events presents an even greater challenge for our long-term planners. Since effective collaboration is based on properly set clear objectives, goals, and communications, we start today with this workshop between the board and the council leveraging existing resources, will harness the strengths of all who contribute and eventually benefit from this new innovative ways. I'm pleased you're all here today. I'm looking forward to a robust discussion about the future of state investments in Delta levees. Randy, at this point, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Great, Bill, thank you. I too am uh, encouraged to be here. Uh, the turnout, the public turnout is uh, very encouraging as well and we hope that uh, you will find today's information and 
dialogue between the board and the council informative um, and useful. Uh, I will begin with the roll call, uh, beginning with Council Member Johnson. Demo here. PFO here. Tatayan here. Fiorini here. We have a quorum. Two of our members are unable to be here, Mayor Asia Brown and uh, Ken Weinberg, our newest council member, called yesterday a family illness at home has prevented him from being here today. Um, the 2009 Delta Reform Act gave the Delta Stewardship Council an assignment. Recognizing the critical statewide significance of the Delta region and the important reliance on the levy system, they required the Delta Stewardship Council to promote strategic levy investments that attempt to reduce risks to people, property, and state interests in the Delta, and to recommend priorities for state investment in levy operation, maintenance, and improvements in the Delta. They asked us to act promptly and to work in consultation with the Department of Water Resources, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, the Delta Protection Commission, local agencies, and the California Water Commission. All these agencies have authority and designated responsibilities in the Delta, but there to date has not been a comprehensive method to prioritize state investments in Delta levy operations, maintenance, and improvement projects. Today, this meeting is another step in the process as we develop a Delta levy investment strategy. Our staff has been working for some time collecting data, creating a database to build a decision support tool. That uh, database has been populated uh, by information provided from many in a technical pool of experts as well as uh, some 70 other sources of information. It's the first time that I'm aware of that this amount of information has been collected and resides in one place uh, regarding the Delta levy system. We have several policy decisions to make in relation to the development of our Delta levy investment strategy. And um, we recognize the critical role that the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and the Department of Water Resources have and our council looks forward to the opportunity today that we have to exchange information and receive your thoughts about the policy matters necessary to create an effective Delta levy investment strategy that will be well coordinated with the work that the Central Valley Flood Protection Board uh, is doing. Your chair, Bill Edgar, board member Clyde McDonald, and your executive officer, Leslie Gallagher, have been actively engaged with our Delta Levy investment strategy work from the beginning and have provided comments and suggestions. Your board additionally has provided written guidance to assist our work. We appreciate your collective involvement. Thus far, look forward to the staff presentations and discussion today and to working with you all into the future. I think at this point, uh, I'll ask if the, any of the council members have any comments they'd like to make. No? Then uh, I think we're ready to proceed on to file item number two, Delta Levy Investment Strategy. Dan Ray. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, our, uh, our executive officer, Jessica Pearson, normally would be in this chair, but she's enjoying a well-deserved vacation with her family, so you've got a... Um, put up with me on the B team, but uh, we have been at this now for over uh, three years, uh, trying to uh, improve the policies that are in the Delta plan now, uh, setting uh, priorities for investments in Delta levies and other risk management approaches. You know, when the council acted on the plan uh, a few years ago, they did so uh, with the understanding that the first task upon its we would undertake upon its completion was to revisit the levy investment uh, strategies so that we had a clearer understanding long term uh, what were the specific priorities and how did those investments fit together with the water supply reliability ecosystem management and uh, provisions as well as our uh, efforts to protect the kind of unique values of the delta as a farming area and as a, a, a community that people love to live in and visit and uh, 
Dustin Jones, our uh, key engineer who's been leading that effort, has been working on it long and hard. It's part of a larger risk management strategy. We talk about it as a Delta Levy investment strategy. That's how we branded it several years ago. But our council members are always reminding us that the f includes provisions that uh, encourage local governments to restrict the use of flood-prone uh, rural farmlands uh, to those uses, not, not to be in urbanizing areas that are at significant flood risk. Um, efforts to take some le levied areas and restore them to efficient wildlife habitat and understanding that the uh, levees uh, are important to protecting uh, water quality and the conveyance of water through the delta. And that in addition to um, land use management and uh, levy investments, we also need to be thinking about insurance and uh, other aspects that help reduce risk in the region. Uh, we had the chance to talk with you all uh, just last month about the, the, some of the details of the levy investment strategy, but I asked Dustin to spend a few moments kind of re reminding us of some of the key points he made then, uh, and then he's available to answer questions you might have. Yeah. Good morning, board, and good morning, chair. Thank you for inviting us here today. Good morning. As both President Edgar and uh, Chairman Fiorini alluded to, this project started with the Delta Reform Act, and a portion of that Reform Act stated thank you. that we are, as part of the Delta Plan, reducing risk to people, property, and state interests within the Delta by promoting strategic levy investments. And as Dan just uh, reiterated also, a portion of this is the Delta Levy's investment strategy, but we are working within a broader context of also um, evaluating emergency response and preparedness as a means of reducing risk and also um, what land use decisions could be made for reducing risk in the Delta as well. So the project that we've been speaking about uh, and is getting probably the most attention over the last year or so is the Delta Levy's investment portion of this. But I just want to reiterate that it is part of a broader scope that, that's being worked on for risk reduction within the Delta. And the other portion of this uh, Delta Reform Act that really brings us here today is that the Council, in consultation with the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, shall recommend priorities for state investments in levy operations, maintenance, and improvements. This is within the Delta and Sassoon March, and also considering project and non-project levies within the Delta. So there is a direct connection between our projects and with the state plan of flood control. So we have been working in coordination with both the Department of Water Resources and flood board members for some time to make sure we're working towards a common goal. The assignment that we're given as part of the Delta Reform Act is to reduce risk in the Delta. And so one of our original tasks was to identify reduce risk to what? There are many aspects that make up the Delta. And with direction from the Council in uh, 2015, um, in the fall of 2015, we've given these items or categories to focus on, which include people, property, state interest in the Delta, including the co-equal goals of water supply, reliability, and ecosystem within the Delta, and all this while considering the Delta as an evolving place and the unique characteristics of the Delta. The expected outcome with our project is to come up with a prioritized list of islands and tracts for investment for state inv funds over the next few years and also considering long-term investments uh, that would be affected by climate change or uh, other impacts that be coming in the future beyond what a near-term implementation would be. We're developing a comprehensive risk reduction strategy, as I mentioned, that goes beyond just levy investments, but also considers other aspects that could be done, such as emergency response and preparedness and land use decisions. This will lead to Delta Plan policy changes over the next year. As you know, our Delta Plan is evaluated every five years. The next increment will be coming about in 2018. So the work that we're doing will lead to changes to some of the policies and recommendations contained within the Delta Plan as we're moving forward to the next um, version or Delta Plan that comes out. We're also working on developing recommendations to the legislature and other agencies. This would go beyond the specific Delta Plan portions, but 
recommendations that could improve risk beyond just what our agency is taking on and um, other implementation measures that we would like the legislature to consider in the future. Our next steps over the, in the very near term, it, as I mentioned, is to identify high priority islands for investment. And if you remember, um, thinking back, not everybody was able to participate uh, in our last few monthly council meetings, but we've been building on this discussion, as Dan mentioned, for the last few years. Last month, we offered some perspectives to the council of how priorities could be shaped within the Delta, um, looking at different perspectives, um, such as the perspective of flood emergency managers, the Delta um, stakeholders of balancing the risk, um, what would it look like if we were just focused on the co-equal goals of water supply and habitat restoration. So we offered some of those different perspectives last month. And next, I'm sorry, this month, next week at the August Council meeting, we'll bring forward uh, some discussion items for the Council to consider to give us direction as we start in our next phase of outreach of what recommendations could look like and what a prioritization scheme could look like for the um, Delta plan. So we'll ask the Council for some guidance on that next week and then we'll start another round of outreach sessions, uh, most likely in October. The draft uh, risk reduction strategy is going to, as I mentioned, um, include investment priorities for islands and tracts within the Delta. Delta plan risk reduction policy changes. There is specifically one policy change that it, uh, will have the most impact. That's our risk reduction policy one that guides state investments for risk reduction in the Delta. And also Delta plan recommendations that make up um, our risk reduction chapter in the Delta plan. We'll begin the CEQA review. Uh, the, that process is going to start in the fall of this year and carry into um, approximately the spring of 2017. And as I mentioned, preparing a report to the legislature. The priorities and recommendations that we hope to have drafted up for the legislature and also the proposed amendments to the Delta plan, we have plan on having that uh, complete by the end of this year, 2016. That's it for my portion. Thank you, Dustin. Any, any questions of Dustin regarding the work that is underway? I guess uh, one of the questions I would have, Randy, is um, it, it seems to me we've been kind of dancing around this issue a little bit, but I would assume that the goal of both the council and the board is to have a Delta levy investment strategy embedded into the flood plan and the Delta plan that are the same. Is that what everybody is thinking at this point? Yeah, that, that certainly has been one of the objectives that we have been working towards and we have been uh, paying quite a bit of attention to the existing flood plan We've had staff participating in your regional working groups that are developing kind of the bottoms up approach. We've been consulting with your staff. We've reviewed and commented on uh, each of the core feasibility studies that have emerged uh, in the, for the Delta, including the project levies over the last few years. And so we're trying to be cognizant of where things are headed and shaping the uh, suggestions that we, we might bring to the council with the anticipation that they will be aligned with the uh, flood plan, yeah. Okay, I, I, I thought that was kind of implied, but I wasn't sure whether the council and the board has, um, a, you know, basically adopted that as a direction to the staff. Um, if it is, then I think that's a giant step forward for mankind. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that the, um, designating of two board members and council members to work with staff into the future uh, is in support of that because right now we're operating without an updated Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. When that is released, I would expect our, our staffs to review those, to comb through those looking for any possible conflicts between the levy investment strategy work and the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan and to utilize the designated board members and staff to have discussions about that, so. I agree, I agree. Uh, yes. Mr. Johnson. Actually, good morning. Yeah, good morning, hi. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I think 
Your question is a good one we ought to keep in mind as we go through today as, as well as the whole process. Um, in particular, <clears throat> how does um, the board's authority um, <clears throat> coalesce with the council's presumed priorities <clears throat> of the co-equal goals? And, and in particular, <clears throat> how do you view environmental enhancement with respect to a, a flood protection plan? Is it, it's mentioned in, in your um, reports, is it an afterthought? Is it one of many? Is it central? I mean, we wrestle with this ourselves because the, <clears throat> the levee protection effort over a long period of years has been primarily on protection of life and property and, you know, water systems environmental has been a requirement as opposed to a goal. Yeah, I think uh, probably uh, Ms. Suarez can talk about that um, a little better than I can, but, but the, the board is very interested in, in um, multi-benefit projects. We have, um, as you know, part of the flood plan is um, what's called the conservation strategy. And that is, in fact, a document that uh, will be embedded into the plan. And basically, the funding for the plan, just to give you some numbers here, is estimated at this point to be, uh, to, um, to carry out the plan is $23 billion. And of that $23 billion, the, uh, there's $5 billion for operation and maintenance. Now, one of the policy issues here is there's obviously no appetite for that kind of money. We have to prioritize the investments. And what we've said is that those projects that are multi-beneficial, that is, meet multi-objectives, including environmental goals, are the ones that are going to be funded. And so that's, we, we have a, a, an advisory committee that has been meeting with the stakeholders and the NGOs and the resource agencies to just try to get our arms around how we make these projects more multi-beneficial. And that's what's, that's what's being done now in, with the Yolo Bypass uh, uh, pilot project and what's being done in some of the other areas. But, uh, she and Clyde have uh, convened the, an advisory group that's, that's dealing with that question right now. And we, we, as I say, that's one of the most important features of the plan coming forward, I believe. Emma, you were mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I, I think that the goal of any of our efforts, again, the board adopts the revisions to the 2012 Central Valley Flood Protection Plan based on a plan that's delivered as a draft from the Department of Water Resources. What the advisory committee has tried to do, and, um, and it's a process that we hope will continue forward, is help, one of the key communication um, points that we heard from um, stakeholders interested in seeing multi-benefit projects is their, they wanted to be, feel more comfortable than in the planning of projects that the Department, Department of Water Resources does, flood protection projects, that will be outlined in the revisions of the 2012 plan, that there is a, a feeling that multi-benefit projects are kind of embedding in that planning process. And there has been a, a, a concern that in the past maybe hasn't been as transparent as stakeholders would wish. So one of our goals is, as we have been for the past eight months uh, meeting on the advisory committee, is to kind of get that dialogue go going regarding as you're planning these projects, make it more transparent for people that have multi-benefit projects as a priority, feel like in your planning processes you're really taking that in consideration. 
the proof will be in the pudding as we move forward on the 20 revisions and as the Department of Water Resources starts putting together specific projects to implement the 2017 revisions to the plan. I think, uh, Mr. Johnson, they're, they're, the advisory committee was established really to reconcile the uh, problems and issues, concerns that have come up uh, between the NGOs, the resource agencies, and the flood management division of DWR to try and reconcile uh, those, those issues. We have another group uh, that's been meeting for a couple of years on trying to do the same thing with the system-wide flood improvements that the department is recommending to the system as a whole versus the regional flood projects that the regional groups have come up with to reconcile those ideas. And the third group is, is the one that, that I am really interested in, and that's the finance group that's going to come up and decide um, how we're going to fund these um, these improvements and ongoing operation and maintenance. And some of us feel very strongly that before we get into more capital improvements, we better take care of what we have now. From every report we have, department's inspection report, the Corps' engineering periodic inspection report that pointed out that this, this is, the system's a mess. It, it's old, it's worn out, it needs repair, and it needs expanded, and it needs to be more resilient. Every report, 95% uh, of the levies in the Central Valley are out of compliance. So we've got to focus in on operation and maintenance, in, in my view. That's not speaking for the board because we haven't talked about that yet in, in public. But that, that is an absolute major issue that's going to have to be discussed. Do we spend our money on taking care of what we have, or do we spend money in capital, and we need both? So bottom line is we'll probably end up doing a little bit of both, but uh, that's going to be a big debate, I think, going into uh, next year. <clears throat> There's a button in the you're good okay. not good there it is <laughs> um, I just wanted to make one um, point and put a flag up in response to the question that was asked and we can come back to this uh, but we were provided um, one of the uh, documents from the council that has a January 2015 date on it um, and it's a really great summary of um, I think where things were at that point with the investment strategy and there's reference in there to the PL8499 standard and the history of that standard, and it's um, the intention from time to time to have it um, in the delta. Uh, but there's another section further down on the environmental issues, and it reads a lot like probably the words in the Central Valley Flood Plan now from 2012. And there's one section there, one bullet under um, uh, number 12, which... What, what page are you on? I'm on page 26. Um, and it's under the header of what provision should be made to improve habitat for fish and wildlife or provide public recreation. And there's a section on setback levies and protecting restoration opportunities. But the point I wanted to make was the bullet after that is vegetation on levees. And it says that the Corps should exempt delta levees from their veg policy. And we had a very long discussion uh, four and a half years ago, um, four plus years ago, about the vegetation policy the court adopted and how it applied to that standard in the Central Valley. And as a consequence, we adopted a different policy than the court had as part of our 2012 package for the very reason that I think we're all talking about now and looking at multi-benefit projects and trying to make sure that we thought about what we think California wants. So there's an issue there that we just need to be mindful of, but I think generally we have a lot of the same intention. And I think the state folks really want to line up together to make sure we're on the same page, but there's another piece of this puzzle that we need to wrestle with, which is the federal side. Tim, is your point that the work that you've done with the Corps uh, brings the levy uh, vegetation standards up to something that's acceptable to the flood board? No, no it's, it's not. No, it's no, different. So you're emphasizing this <laughs> no. as a key point. It's a conflict right now. Okay. It's an inherent conflict, okay. um, and as a consequence, 
uh, for this and other reasons, when the Corps was doing their inspections in the Central Valley, Mike can give me the number. I don't have it in front of me I'm from our staff, but a lot of the levees uh, in the Central Valley have been inspected both by the state and the Corps, and the Corps um, has really ratcheted up their inspections and has taken a lot of the systems out of that program now. Um, in, the, in fact, most of the systems are out of the program very formally not just because of this issue, but in part because of this. And it started four years ago. Maintenance is a big part of it, too. So, but I think fundamentally we have to wrestle with this issue because when projects get uh, awarded for construction, they have to get permitted. And there are federal and state requirements. And the state requirements are not the same as the federal requirements for environmental review. And doing right by the environment is a big deal for California. And it's been really hard and in some cases uh, impossible to meet the federal standard in a way that's consistent with what we think the state needs. So I think all of us want the same thing, but we're trying to thread the needle on the federal side in particular to make sure that we do have a place to plug in and have those projects not just funded, but permitted in a way that makes sense so that we can both have flood protection, but also we can do what we can to restore the environment. And that includes the Delta. Yeah, just on that point, uh, Randy, I think it's uh, since 2012, a new uh, Water Resources Development Act was approved by Congress. There's some language in there directing the Corps to look at different vegetation um, regimes and, and policies. And they are in the process of doing that now. And one of the things that this working group ought to be looking at is the status of that and how we move the core to where the state of California is on vegetation. That, that, that's the whole objective here. And it, it's, as Tim said, it's really out of sync right now. Okay. Good. Thanks for that. Other questions? Uh, Emma? Yeah, I wanted some clarification um, just in terms of timing. The revisions to the flood plan will come to the board probably at the beginning, at the end of this year, if not the beginning of next year. And we have a statutorily mandated timetable that we need to act upon, have public hearings and act upon and adopt, um, amend if necessary and, and adopt. It sounds like, is, I guess the question is, will the investment strategy be finalized enough in time for discussions that occur in this small group they can influence um, our decision-making process and ensure that whatever we adopt in come June of 2017 is, is consistent. I'm, I'm not sure I, I know what the timing, I, I have a good sense of what the timing is. For discussion purposes, we will be, I think, far enough along that you folks will have enough information to know, you know, the direction we're going in. And actually, with our August council meeting, we're planning on providing much more depth of what we plan on making uh, as far as changes within our Delta plan and the Chapter 7 revisions. So we'll have a discussion version of that at the August meeting. So that'll give you, I think, a fairly detailed um, idea of where we're going. And then we'll be able to work at least through the end of this year before we finalize any strategies. Um, if there's anything inconsistent with there, or if there's anything you feel like we need to change or revisit, I, th I think too. You know, if we think about or anticipate our own uh, schedule, partly you have to acknowledge. You know, when the council directed us to do this, they wanted it done. You know, yesterday we're a couple of years behind the target that they had <laughs> set to get it done. So we always, you know, feel that pressure behind us as we try to get to move this ahead. Um, what we hope to have by the end of this fiscal year is essentially like a preferred alternative that we can use to do the rest of the CEQA work. So we should have a, you know, a, a, a provisions that you can review that by, you know, maybe November and certainly December. And then I think in the new year, uh, as we're completing the CEQA process and you're developing you're reviewing the plan that the Department of Water Resources has submitted to you. We have plenty of time to coordinate through that area. So it's not, it's not. So it sounds that it won't be that, uh, uh, we won't have a timing problem when it comes to the investment strategy, but we might have a timing problem when it comes to your, the revision of your Delta plan. 
Because you're looking at 2018, is that correct? Oh, I think we'll, we expect that the amendment, of, this amendment of the plan would occur in, in 2017, you know, in, a, in anticipation of the five-year review happening following here. Okay, thank you. A uh, note on the, the microphone system, the technology. These uh, transformers in the microphone pick up static from electronic devices, and so what you're finding is that our crack staff over here is muting you because of feedback from the electronic devices. So that's why you're, there is this pause when you begin to speak and, and no amplification occurs. So if you can move your electronic devices a little bit further, they won't mute you and the audience will be able to hear the very first word that you speak. <laughs> it might not be worth hearing. <laughs> any, uh, any other questions regarding uh, Dustin and Dan's presentation? Yes, Joe? <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how appropriate th this comment is, but I think it's important to uh, recognize that the board has this responsibility of the assurances, to keep the assurances that we give to the federal government how the system would be operated and maintained. It's our responsibility to assure, you know, that happens. And the one area that where it gets a little tricky, I think, is when um, many of us on the board have a big heart about um, environmental plantings and improvements and so forth and many times the um, bypass system I'm thinking specifically now the yellow bypass seems to offer lots of opportunity to uh, do environmental uh, enhancement and, and do good things for the environment but we <clears throat> we still have this um, requirement of meeting this, this federal responsibility and a few years ago the Corps added this an, another layer to that which is called their 408 process that we actually if there's some modification that's done to the federal system it ha has to go to all the way to Washington and they have to approve it and many times uh, <coughs> they they may take a kind of a hardline stance uh, about certain environmental improvements, especially, you know, what the hydraulic impacts might be to an environmental enhancement that, that locally we find acceptable. It still has this filter that it needs to go through of meeting this federal requirement. So I just want to make sure that even though all of us, I think, kind of want a lot of the same things. Um, we still have the, <clears throat> this basic requirement that has to go through and uh, we have to keep that in mind. So when we propose some uh, environmental features, we need to think about how, what's the potential for impacting the existing flood system. And our biggest uh, opportunity, of course, is where we do setbacks uh, of the levees because then that creates some hydraulic space that vegetation or, or whatever we have in mind can uh, maybe go in there and, and still the system would perform overall as we promised. So I, I just wanted to just lay that out there for everybody. Joe, um, Bill mentioned earlier the work that's underway in the Yolo Bypass. I, I described that as a living laboratory. Uh, are you encouraged? by the level of cooperation that you have observed between the core, uh, the departments, the local agencies with uh, the work related to levy improvements and environmental issues in the Yolo Bypass? Um, I go, you know, working in the Yolo Bypass and the flood system some 45 years now. And the level of cooperation is at a level that I've never seen before. I'm so heartened by the fact that uh, Solano, Yolo County, and Sacramento County, the cities, Sacramento and West Sacramento are all cooperating to make these improvements to the system and make it work. So yeah, we've made just an unbelievable uh, advancement in cooperation. And I think 
I feel that the board gets some credit for this because we uh, funded the local interest to participate in the planning process so their voice could be heard. It wasn't just going and laying stuff in front of them saying, what do you think? We actually helped fund their consultant level so they could participate uh, with us in the DWR and the <coughs> development of the plan. So now, I, and so hopes are very high. Now we need to perform, you know, because uh, we've encouraged participation. We encourage people to tell them, yeah, you'll be heard and the NGOs and everybody. So I think there's high anticipation and it's time now to uh, step forward and, and show that we can make this work uh, for multi-purposes. Yeah, I think, Randy, a lot of that credit needs to go to Chris Jernell of the agency who is uh, able to look across the administration and bring together the agencies that are necessary to make that work, and he's done a, just a terrific job at that, I think. Yeah, I agree, and it, it's been my sense that the Army Corps has taken a, a little bit different view than historically uh, in relation to some of the work in the Yolo Bypass. That's why I was glad, Joe, you thought that things are improving. Well, there's a lot of work to do on the Corps side. Yeah, I, I worked for the Corps for 20 years, so I know a little bit about the Corps. Yeah, the, yes, you do. They're, they're, and, uh, they're still laying in the weeds. They're right? like a battleship. They they change direction very slowly. You know, it's not, you don't get rapid change with the core. And I feel, especially locally, the local yeah. district office is, uh, really understands it and is really wants to participate and make things work. But, you know, their chain of command, it's a military chain of command and it goes all the way to Washington, D.C. And the people, there are people in Washington, D.C. that don't necessarily understand the system very well. So I think the core will be a continuing challenge to bring along. And uh, the local people especially have been very, very good about it. But we still, whatever we come up with is still going to have to be proved up the chain of command to Washington. So just a little caution there. Other questions? Bill, I think we're ready yep. to proceed to... Yeah, I uh, think we're ready to move to um, Eric, uh, item uh, two there, which is the uh, presentation or at least summary of our guidance document that we submitted before and uh, uh, submitted for your uh, consideration. Eric? This would be file item number three. Uh, good morning, President Edgar, uh, Council Fiorini, and uh, members of our board and council. Um, I'm a, Eric Butler. I'm one of the chiefs of our uh, board, and I'm chief of our plan implementation and compliance branch. Um, today, I'm just going to review some of the development of our yeah, consultation great. guidance yeah. regarding the levy investment strategy, or sometimes I'll call it DLIS, and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the board's guiding the themes that were developed uh, a year ago. So we know that the the islands, am I not loud enough? Uh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I think it would be helpful because council members that were not able to participate in the um, meeting we, we had um, down in the Delta that helped inform these, these um, points that we shared um, via letter. Maybe we can give a little background on that. Um, we actually have that background, um, Madam Vice President. We're coming up to that. Okay, great. Thanks. No PowerPoint. So the, um, as we know, the islands in the Delta are protected by a, an intricate series of levees. And as we've heard, some are locally owned and maintained, and, and others are part of the State Plan of Flood Control, or the SPFC. There's about 1,000, 1,100 miles of levees and protecting about 700,000 acres of delta lowlands. Uh, about a third of those levees are state plan of flood control levees. So about 385 miles are the levees that Mr. Countryman referred to where the board has given assurances to the Corps to operate and maintain those pursuant to uh, 
some historical agreements. The, and, and those levees are part of an authorized federal flood control system um, that manages the flooding on the Sacramento and San Joaquin, uh, San Joaquin rivers. The remaining delta levee, so a little over 700 miles, and all of the Sassoon Marsh levees, about 230 miles, are non-project or local levees. So for those non-project and local levees, there's no assurances from the state to the core. So as, uh, as Board Member Suarez alluded to, in July of 2015, uh, we conducted a workshop down in Clarksburg to develop, uh, to start developing a set of principles which were based on public safety priorities that could, use, that could be used to frame discussions and to provide input to the council staff, oops, uh, to the council staff, to consultants, and to others to ensure that public safety and flood reduction awareness were considered in your strategy and related delta planning activities. And so we received an update from your staff and on their progress on the strategy to that point in time. And our staff introduced several initial themes uh, for the board to consider toward development of a set of principles to use in these future discussions. Uh, we heard several public comments from local uh, Delta landowners, from flood control agencies, the Department of Water Resources, uh, the Delta Protection Commission, and your staff, the council staff. Uh, which were heard and that brought a lot of additional focus uh, at the time to our draft themes. At the end of the meeting, the board expressed support to pursue a single state investment strategy that first recognized that there are plans and projects such as DWR's Delta Subventions Program that are already at work both within the Delta or throughout the Central Valley system and two, considers that existing policies and priorities, and three, includes an analysis of those existing strategies and programs to be used as a baseline to discuss any recommended changes. Our board members emphasized that system-wide needs include priorities outlined in the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, which was adopted in 2012, commonly referred to as the Flood Plan, and also emphasized that recommendations in that valley-wide plan must remain part of the discussion as the Delta levy investment strategy is developed. Our board members also express interest that the strategy would include a chart of time frames, including near, mid, and long-term planning horizons, include major decisions anticipated in each time frame, and also include how predicted climate change, subsidence, earthquakes, and future flood events might be incorporated into the strategy. And after uh, further deliberation by our board members, they requested that our staff return at a future board meeting with draft consultation guidance for their consideration. So two months later in September of 2015, our staff presented this draft guidance to the board and it was arranged around three themes, public safety, risk reduction, and jurisdiction. And specifically, our staff recommended that the board adopt this consultation guidance for use in collaborating with and providing comments to the Stewardship Council to determine priorities for state investments in levy operation, maintenance, and improvements in the Delta, including both state plan of flood control and non-project levies. The guidance was unanimously adopted by our board for use by our staff and liaison board members when entering into discussions with the Council recognizing that as we learn and become more seriously involved with this process, our comments and guidance may change. And after that meeting, Executive Officer Gallagher distributed this guidance to our staff and directed us that it was intended to be used to inform and guide our interactions with the Stewardship Council and their staff as the DLS is drafted. Our interactions with council staff must be consistent with the three themes provided in a guidance document, which I will now summarize. Theme one, public safety. The board views the levy investment strategy through the lens of its public safety mission to improve flood risk management throughout the Central Valley. While the co-equal goals of water supply reliability and environmental enhancement, along with preservation as of the Delta as a place 
are important and laudable goals. They're not the only governing principles in the Delta. The levy investment strategy must consider all public agency interests in the Delta flood protection system and must ensure new strategies do not impede implementation of other state priorities, projects, or goals. The flood plan centers around the public policy need to improve flood risk management for the entire Central Valley, including the Delta. The flood plan is updated every five years, beginning in 2017, and each update will provide support for subsequent policy program and project implementation. As the strategy is developed, recognition of the flood plan's system-wide approach and its adopted public policies must be factored into the Delta-specific levy investment strategy. And investment strategies in the Delta strategy must complement and supplement those of the flood plan. Competing strategies within the Delta must be avoided. So today's workshop is a very important step toward development of that single, unified, and collaborative levy investment strategy. The flood plan proposes a state system-wide investment approach, commonly referred to as SSIA, for sustainable, integrated flood management in areas currently protected by facilities of the state plan of flood control. The first five-year update, it's currently under development. It's expected to be adopted by the board next June and on five-year cycles thereafter. The flood plan provides an integrated approach for addressing risk, flood risk, that recognizes, one, the interconnection of flood management actions with broader water resources management and land use planning. Two, the value of coordinating across geographic and agency boundaries. Three, the need to evaluate opportunities and potential impacts from a system perspective, and four, the importance of environmental stewardship and sustainability. The flood plan evaluations are carried out on a system-wide basis, which consider how all parts of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River basins and their flood protection facilities interrelate in the movement of flood flows from the rim reservoirs down the river systems and through the delta to the bay. The flood plan also looks to consider sustainable projects which are socially, environmentally, and financially feasible for an enduring period. A, sustain a, sus <laughs> tongue -tied. a sustainable project will also have flexibility to adapt to potential future changes such as climate change. Theme two, risk reduction and state liability. The board will emphasize the need to protect state investments in infrastructure, critical public services, and environmental enhancement in the strategy. In addition to loss of life, levee failures and the associated inundation can cause destruction of property and infrastructure, interruption of water supply, and damage to critical environmental, agricultural, navigation, and recreational interests in the Delta. As the levee investment strategy is developed, the risk to state, risks to the state resulting from failure of delta levees due to floods, earthquakes, subsidence, seepage, or climate change must be analyzed. The levee investment strategy must consider the state's existing and significant public infrastructure investment in the delta. Since the passage of Propositions 1E in 84 in 2006, the state has invested approximately $200 million in flood control and habitat projects carried out by local agencies in the Delta under DWR's Delta Subventions Program. Levy improvements funded by this program have undoubtedly reduced the overall level of flood risk in the Delta. And as the strategy is developed, it's imperative that strategies to reduce overall state liability are considered as preferred options. Specifically, the strategy should focus on reduction of known flood risks, analyze what residual risks remain after implementation, seek to reduce those resi residual risks, and ensure that no new risks are created by implementation of the strategy. The third and final theme addresses jurisdiction. The levy investment strategy should discuss existing legal and contractual obligations of the state and should utilize the board's regulatory authority to manage both state plan of flood control and local delta levies. The board has broad authority over the state plan of flood control, as well as several designated floodways and regulated streams in the Delta. And we manage several programs 
which I'll briefly highlight. DWR's Delta Subventions Reimbursement Program funds, on a cost-shared basis, local levy maintaining agencies for rehabilitation and maintenance of Delta levies. Recently, Subventions Program staff worked tirelessly with Delta stakeholders and board members to address the concerns regarding program guidelines and incorporated changes in response to those concerns and the board will consider adoption of those updated guidelines at our upcoming August 26th board meeting. Our operations branch permitting section manages the board's encroachment permit program, including review of new applications, of proposed projects, field investigation of projects, and resolution of field problems associated with approved permits on or adjacent to state plan of flood control and local levies, regulated streams and designated floodways in the Delta and Central Valley pursuant to California Code of Regulations Division 1 Title 23. Our operations branch enforcement section enforces compliance with Title 23 and federal regulations of unpermitted or illegal encroachments either through removal or modification and works to bring non-compliant permitted encroachments into compliance. The enforcement section also acts as a liaison between the local maintaining agencies and the Corps of Engineers to ensure that federal information, including levy inspection results, are transmitted and understood. An overriding goal of these activities is to maintain or restore federal public law 8499 eligibility to state plan of flood control levy systems in the Central Valley and the Delta. And our plan implementation and compliance branch supports the board's role as the non-federal sponsor for studies and levy improvement projects constructed by the Corps of Engineers and for local and state sponsored levy improvement projects. The branch provides collaborative interagency and stakeholder coordination and has helped formulate successful solutions to develop, review, and implement plans, programs, and projects consistent with the goals of the California Water Action Plan, the Board's Strategic Plan, and the Flood Plan, all pursuant to Water Code, Title 23, Federal Title 33, Section 408, and other state and federal regulations and policies. And lastly, our Environmental Services and Land Management Branch carry out environmental planning, analysis, and compliance components of the Board's permitting and enforcement activities, as well as real estate, land use and acquisition, and property management matters within the Sacramento and San Joaquin drainage district. Opportunities to incorporate these programs into the Delta Levy investment strategy utilizing existing authorities and resources will be of primary importance to our board. In, in conclusion, we understand that the council staff has been working with these themes now for some time and we look forward to hearing how they have been already incorporated into or how they'll uh, be added to the strategy moving forward. And again, we have uh, program staff here from both the board and the department to uh, answer any questions that either our board or your council may have. So thank you very much. Okay, members, uh, any questions? Uh, Mr. Johnson. I got a hammer in the car. <laughs> <laughs> meeting of your board to revise guidelines for application for state funding. Is that consistent with the Delta plans um, work? <clears throat> I mean, our own levy investment strategy. We've reviewed the guidelines. I think one of the, um, we didn't see any substantial conflicts with the Delta plan today. Um, I think we've recognized that as the council acts on plan updates, there may be need to revisit some elements of the guidelines. In fact, the recommendation we make might suggest some revisions to the guidelines. Uh, but I think now it makes complete sense for the board to proceed with the work they've had underway. Well, so, so, Bill, going back to what you opened with is that we ought to be in sync or at least figure out why we're not and resolve it if we can. Um, uh, is it the case that DWR revised its guidelines as a sort of binder that tells people how to apply and get state money for projects, and then it goes to your board and you have to review it or approve it? Is that right? 
Yeah, the, the guidelines are essentially the, the uh, operating implementation procedures and policies of, of the right. subventions program. So, so what struck me about reading it before they proposed a revision was that it, <coughs> it, it was kind of a manual for reclamation districts and others to figure out what you had to do to qualify for funding and what the rules were. <clears throat> it didn't seem to incorporate much in the way of what the goals were, the priorities, or the state interests. <clears throat> Maybe that's not the purpose of the guidelines. But it would seem like if it's a manual to do that and you're revising it with DWR, that it ought to, at least by reference, incorporate this larger work that you've undertaken and we've undertaken to figure out, well, how do we prioritize doing the common work here with limited funds? Yeah, I think, I think we've got the cart a little before the, ho the horse here. Um, what we have are the guidelines that are out of date, and Joe was on the working group to revise those that needed revision. Um, but the policies that are going to be in the plan, adopted in the plan or in the Delta plan, have not been finalized at this point. So we got a, we had a dilemma of, of whether to move forward on the guidelines now, revisions that, that were required, or, <clears throat> or wait. And, and we, at this point, we're not going to wait. Joe, maybe you have some comments on that. Well, I think the, really the guidelines that we have currently are pertaining to the maintenance of the existing system and the state interest in helping with that. And I don't, I don't see where we'll be changing that um, in, in, in the short term at all. So I think to keep the program going of maintaining and operating the levy system, the guidelines need to go forward. Yeah, I think, I think what Mr. Johnson is referring to is from a big picture standpoint, if for example, the Delta uh, or the uh, financial plan, which is now being prepared for the, the flood plan, comes out and says, you know, things about cost sharing, things about uh, prioritizing uh, maintenance versus capital, those kinds of things. It seems to me then the, the programs that implement those policies are going to have to be revised to be compliant, but we don't have them yet. Right. And, and so that's, that's what you're saying, I guess. Yeah. The, the, I mean, we're, we're saying this is where we are right now. We're, we're going forward, but uh, if we need to make revisions to be consistent with the state policy, then we can do that at, the, at that time. So, Joe, Joe m m maybe you ought to do what the Water Board seems to be doing on flow standards, which is have interim guidelines pending the work that you're doing and we're doing. Because otherwise you're giving a approval, in effect, to a set of guidelines that um, confirm pretty much the status quo, which may be where we all end up, but as Bill indicated, cost sharing um, might change, or at least the recommendations as to uh, what locals pay for what kind of projects or um, how multi-benefit projects are valued compared to um, single-purpose projects, however good they are. And, and you know, that that's a Everybody likes multi-benefit projects. It just means, though, that they cost more. And, and there's a big issue as to whether they're just going to cost the state more or they're going to cost uh, the local partner more, too. And, you know, some reclamation districts would say, well, you want have environmental enhancement in the project. You pay for all that. We're interested in flood protection, period. So I I'm concerned that the guidelines, you know, give a, the updating of the guidelines give an impression that everything's fine and then if there are changes that your board or we would want to see or advocate to the legislature or to DWR, 
<clears throat> or we all mutually agree on in the future, they're harder to do if you've just revised the guidelines. Well, um, things are always hard to do, but um, I, I, I see what we've been doing as a maintenance program, and it's to, for the survival of any of the plans in the Delta, we have to have some way of trying to maintain <clears throat> what we have out there. Now, if somewhere we make a decision that parts of this we're not going to maintain any longer, <clears throat> then, you know, that's a major decision that would have to be addressed. But for right now, um, I, I think the guidelines meet the purpose. I mean, the cost sharing has been uh, in actual dollars, something like 50% um, by the locals. Um, so it's been a very, very successful program. And uh, I, you know, if you, by changing the title to interim would be helpful. I don't know, I don't have strong feelings about titles, but I do have strong feelings about the need for the program until we replace it with something else. Other questions? Yes, Judge. Yes, sir. Uh, no one seems surprised by, is it Bill? What you said, uh, you were looking Eric. toward our, our staff. Eric. And our staff has said, well, this, we, we, we knew all about this report, I take it, that we just made. And you're, you're thinking about this being somehow incorporated, perhaps, by us in our strategy? Yeah, we just you're not surprised by any of has been said regarding no this. no and, and Dustin could probably provide more detail but we have been working with this guidance and anticipating yeah. that you and others are going to want It'd be to be comforting to know that you know as, as you know maybe you have to say that yeah, said, this is fine yeah. we're working with the, the uh, board and we've got the board yeah. staff and we're moving along in a cooperative effort that's that's one of the key efforts uh, as you see it and I guess we see it as well yeah. We have our strategy, but it's not just in isolation with a, by ourselves, yeah. with our thinking, but we also are bringing in the thoughts of the board. And we have been staff. trying to do that, and I hope okay. we're being successful. It, it, by the way, uh, would it have been any help to have uh, someone from the core here? I mean, they seem to be a missing link here somehow. I, I, maybe that was not in the thinking here, but <clears throat> I would, I, you know, we would kind of be spinning our wheels if they come in and say, well, you got it all wrong. That's not going to happen. Or is it? Well, uh, I th we know that the, the, you know, the key yeah. programs the Corps has on the boards today in terms of their major levy investment uh, studies that are, would affect the, the, port, the Delta areas that we're interested in. And some we've been really pleased with, you know, and they've proposed substantial protection for at-risk areas where at least they're evaluating in the pocket in West Sacramento and Metropolitan Stockton. You also know we're not too thrilled with their conclusion. There's no federal interest in improving the rural levies and the non-project levies in the Delta that are so important for water quality and other purposes down there. Um, we've been in contact with them about the work that uh, Chairman Edgar mentioned, their reevaluation of their regulations regarding uh, vegetation on levies, as an example, and we've been encouraging them to uh, do something that's reasonable for the Delta and for the rest of the Valley because we know what a barrier it is. So I think, you know, the, the challenge always with federal agencies and I think the Corps, especially given the kind of more rigid plotting structure they work with, is to get them at the table and you've seen them a couple times at our council meetings, yep. to get them at the table and really be able to have a, a useful discussion with them. You know? And we, we struggle with that through the implementation committee, uh, but I think we've been pleased with their participation to date and it's growing all the time. The work in the uh, bypass, the old bypass is the, the real test, I think, as uh, Mr. Countryman pointed out, of can we really work together? It's a project that's big enough that we need the core. It's the kind of place where their involvement makes a big difference. And so I think if th that's another area where cooperation with them is really important. Maybe, uh, Dan, this working group can have a little bit more uh, uh, 
presence from the core, I think it would be helpful in a small group like that to uh, get down to the nitty gritty on some of these issues that they're going to have to deal with, uh, 408 and so on. So at this point, oh, uh, yeah, please. Thank you. I am kind of wanted to um, follow up a little bit, um, Mr. Jones, um, earlier presentation, but tied to the subventions program for a second, since this is the area of discussion that we seem to be, we're focusing right now. And I, I look back at your presentation and I see that, um, and forgive me, I'm not very familiar with, with the statutory requirements regarding the Delta plan and the um, investment strategy, but is it correct you're preparing a report that's going to go to the legislature at the end of this year? Yes, that's the intention <laughs> to wrap that up by the end of this year and start submitting and going through the uh, Office of Administrative Law Procedures uh, into next year in 2017. Now, our, our regulatory policies, that would be. Yeah. Now, is the um, report, well, do you know whether it will include um, specific legislative recommend changes, statutory recommendations for changes to statutory um, language or specific legislative language? Specifically dealing with the subventions program, or has or has the council made a decision to include any discussion in that legislative um, report well, regarding I, I, recommendations yeah. on statutory changes to the subventions program? What the final report will recommend it's hard to anticipate. As Dustin said, we hope to bring a discussion draft to the council to have them then begin reworking our own some of our thoughts and some of we heard from others in our August and September meetings. I think we'll have a better sense then uh, what suggestions it makes in terms of subventions or other programs. And subventions is really important. Not only does it pay for maintenance, that's what we usually think of, and that's taken the bulk of the money in recent years, but it also pays for major rehabilitation of levies. Um, and so that's another way that's really important uh, that the subventions program can and, and uh, provide some really substantial opportunities in other ways, not just through the maintenance work. Well, if I may, Mr. President and Mr. Chairman, this subgroup that um, we may put together, this is an important issue, certainly if there's going to be a recommendation regarding changes to the subventions program, a program that the board has been historically managing and by all accounts has been very successful, that certainly that should, that should be an item for, for agenda and any proposed changes I think is something that our full board should should consider and, and perhaps take action also. That would be my suggestion. Thank you for that. And, and, and just to affirm what uh, Dustin and Dan have presented, much of the work that has uh, been underway in support of developing a levy investment strategy thus far has been collecting the data and assembling it in a way that uh, can be used to evaluate risk. And so beginning with our council meeting in two weeks, we will now begin to take uh, all of that work that has been developed to understand better where the risks lie and then to begin making the policy decisions in support of a strategy. So your, your question is well-timed. Uh, clearly, in all of the public meetings we've held, the, the comments that we've received, levy, the Levy Subventions Program has been one of the most successful state-funded programs um, um, and, uh, and clearly has, has been very important in contributing uh, about $700 million in the Delta region since the mid-1970s. Uh, but that's certainly an area that we'll be working with you very closely on at the technical and the policy level. Any other council board member comments before we receive public comment? Then, uh, Bill, okay. you've got a, a list of requests. Right. I'll uh, read them as we've received them. Uh, Who's this? Um, uh, <laughs> Roger, Rajin, Radin. Reynolds. Is she here? Okay. Please uh, Regine, come to the, the uh, microphones at the podium, Regine. and 
Welcome. Hello, council members and Central Valley Protection Flood Control members. My name is Rajin Reynolds. I live at 4444 West Undyne Road on the Roberts Island in the South South Delta. Um, I've been before the council before. I've been extremely critical of the Delta Levy investment strategy, in particular their tool. Um, I have a letter. I'm going to read it quickly and then make a couple of comments because there's a cautionary tale here and the devil is in the details. On August 2nd, errors in the Appendix A data of the recently re released draft risk analysis methodology were brought to the attention of Arcata's staff. The errors were purported to be the result of an output formatting problem, and the appendix was to have been corrected by the end of this week, and I have some attached emails. But as of last night, corrections have not been made, and this is the question. How will the council know whether or not other, te other technical problems have affected the data in the decision support tool? Over a year ago, Delta residents expressed concern that baseline data for the decision support tool was incorrect. We were told not to worry, everything was relative, and errors would not skew the island tract ranking. A year later, the data is still not correct, and residents counts for Upper and Middle Roberts Island and Stewart Tract are examples. We have been told the tool will be flexible, and data can be easily changed to reflect current conditions. But who will monitor and update the system? And when will necessary corrections be made? At this time, for example, Stewart Tract has hundreds of homes, I have some photos. And when will that fact enter the system? And how will changes in asset values be verified? For example, cropping patterns have changed, including several thousand acres of new almond plantings in the South Delta. Who is going to verify the truth or error of your baseline information? Without belaboring the point, it is apparent that you, the council, are about to adopt a planning tool which is fundamentally flawed. Whether or not all the measurements are relative, the baseline information is incorrect. Garbage in, garbage out. Like I said, the devil's in the details. And if you're going to rely on tools, they have to start from an accurate place. I have a comment on the money. Um, I have a page from the Caltrans website that states, the total cost regarding sound walls averages $1.8 million per mile. And you can have a copy of this if you want. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your time. I might have a question. <laughs> um, Go. What, why did you give us, uh, Jean, why did you give us the information on the Caltrans sound wall? I didn't, I kind of got well, disconnected there. There's this sense that the state has spent a huge amount of money in the Delta. And I think compared to other state interests, that's not true. Oh, I'm still not sure I understand. But well, I think it was mentioned that there's $700 million that's been spent on levies. Oh. Well, consider the amount spent on sound walls along freeways in the state, $1.8 million per mile. Just trying to get a frame of reference right. for what the costs are. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, Justin Fre Fredrickson.
Good morning. Um, my name is Justin Fredrickson. I'm an environmental policy analyst with the California Farm Bureau, and I've been following the the uh, Delta Levies investment strategy from afar. I haven't been involved in the details much because I've been waiting for deliverables to come out, but it's something that's of interest to the Farm Bureau from a statewide um, perspective, certainly given the importance of the Delta as an agricultural region and also as a, as a water hub for our state. And so uh, if you'll bear with me, I had a, uh, several areas I wanted to hit, and I'll just get as far as I can until you cut me off. Um, uh, first of all, as to uh, the DSC priorities or uh, principles list, um, uh, when we talk about state interests and, and prioritization of investments in the Delta, um, and coming up with a comprehensive plan for investment in Delta levies. I feel like, uh, you know, we've commented on that this in the past, and a lot of other stakeholders did too. The principles didn't go over very well. We're not well received among the, the stakeholders, and I don't feel like a lot of the concerns were corrected in the final version. Um, and uh, for, so one of the things I wanted to mention is that I feel this, you know, this argument, sort of strawman argument that we have, we can't invest in all, all levies equally, Therefore, we have to somehow drastically cut back or, or, or reshuffle the deck is a red herring. Um, uh, I also think that it's a red herring to say that, you know, state interests are only limited to e the ecosystem, urban areas, and water supply. Um, when in reality, I think that Delta the Delta levy system is part of a larger system, as the flood board has pointed out in their principles. Um, very aptly, and uh, you, you cannot take it in isolation. 95% um, of the delta, let's say, is agricultural land, and that is not um, viewed as a state priority except as a part of the delta as an evolving place, um, whatever that means. Um, the reality is that the delta is a system, and the levies in the delta are a state interest, and maintaining those levies over time, keeping what we have and improving those levies in a strategic way, not thinly spread over the, intel to the entire delta, is a state interest. That should be a compelling state interest. That should be reflected in the priorities that, that come out in the DL DLIS and also hopefully in the consultation with the Flood Board and integration with the, with the Central Valley Flood um, Protection Plan. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the next point. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if the the Delta Protection Commission is here, but they also have some statutory uh, charges under the Delta Reform Act. Justin, and, the yeah. chair of the Delta Protection Commission sits on the Delta Stewardship Council. Okay, very good. Nice to meet um, you, Justin. Okay, thank nice you. To meet. Oh, okay, <laughs> yes. Um, I, see, I've been out of this, the Delta game. I got so sick of the Delta game that I just kind of checked out, you know, going around in circles. Well, wait, so wait. some of the hats have changed, but, you know, wait. same circle. We hope you're feeling better now and welcome not back. Not much. <laughs> Honestly not. Um, I've never seen a place more talked about where less happens. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but I want, what I wanted to say is, well anyway, I'll, I'll pass on to the next point. I think that what the Delta Protection Commission is doing on the, the assessment district uh, study is very important and, and so I hope that that is brought into what all of you are doing. Um, on ecosystem, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, this, this idea of multi-benefit projects. They are important, but the Delta is different than other places. Well, it's, it's the same and, and also it's, it's, it, it's more um, markedly different than other places because of the elevational differences. And so in, in most areas of the Delta, you can't do multi-benefit unless it's terrestrial because it's underwater and it doesn't function as habitat. So there are efforts that have looked at where it makes sense to invest in habitat. We actually need to do that because the fish are doing very poorly and that is having regulatory impacts on our water supply. But it's kind of the inverse of what uh, uh, the, the DSC principles say on Delta levy investments. You can't thinly spread investment in multi-benefit projects throughout the entire delta and it doesn't make sense to do so just like it doesn't make sense to do that for levies you need to dar target it to the areas where it's actually going to make a difference and so peter moyle and his good folks over at the the uc at uc davis 
and some of the other ever efforts have, lo have focused on, on the, the Yolo Bypass, on Sassoon Marsh, on Liberty and Prospect Island where the smelters are surviving even though they're, they're tanking where they used to be historically. And uh, some other uh, interests have, or has, has coalesced around projects like Paradise Cut. That's where we need to be focusing. Uh, on multi-benefit projects, and at the same time, we need to allow the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts maintenance of uh, levies to uh, to move forward and not have this artificial co uh, cost constraint of always having to achieve a multi-benefit um, um, objective for every single maintenance or improvement project. Um, okay. And uh, overall, just say on the flood board uh, principles, I think they're very good, and so you've got the right focus there. Thank you. That's the first complimentary thing he's ever said. <laughs> Rob <laughs> Robert Pike. Good morning. I'm Robert Pike. I'm an individual consultant and troublemaker. Uh, I'll spare my qualifications except to note that I was a consultant and expert witness for the plaintiffs in the Paterno case, uh, the winning side. Uh, I might mention for the council members that you should go back and read my comments on the third draft of the Delta Plan. I won't go into that, uh, but you will see echoes of my comments on the third draft of the Delta Plan in the recent uh, court decision. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you should listen to me. Uh, there are probably good reasons, including funding through the governor's office, why you shouldn't listen to me. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what I say uh, bears recording and repeating. I also would like to commend the flood board and um, although I don't remember all the detail, Tom Zuckerman, who couldn't be here today, asked me to commend you on moving in the direction on creating more upstream storage of floods, uh, which is something that he's been promoting for a long time. Complicated issue, but well worth pursuing. Uh, and so that raises the question of whether future actions of the flood board are taken into account in the hydrology uh, that is being considered in the DLIS. Uh, read the DLIS. I famously, uh, in responding to a question from Senator Johnson some years ago, said that the prioritization required by the Delta Reform Act could be done in half a day. I stand by that statement. I have uh, what would be the result of that half a day meeting written on this piece of paper. I won't go into that now. What in fact um, the council and their staff and consultants have done is spend two years and I'm not sure how many uh, dollars developing a methodology or a tool for prioritizing delta levies. Uh, in my fairly long engineering career I have seen many useless studies but this one just about tops them all. Uh, I've actually, I haven't read every word, but I went through the 192 pages. I forgot to bring my copy, otherwise I'd be waving it at you. Um, uh, it basically, it is a fool's errand. I want to make that clear. I didn't choose that term lightly. Uh, the development of that tool is a fool's errand. I'll try to briefly explain why. Those kinds of optimization studies, if you have structures or systems which are well defined, are still difficult if you're dealing with natural phenomena like floods and earthquakes which have a lot of uncertainty in them. So even if your structure or system is well defined, this is a very difficult thing to do. The Delta Levy system is a long linear system that is in fact continuously variable. And so in order to analyze it, you have to chop it up. 
into smaller pieces and assume that that piece is all the same. That introduces an approximation or an error. There is uncertainty in that error. That is added to the other uncertainties in the problem, the uncertainties in the natural phenomena. Uh, it sort of assumes that you've got the data right in the first place, which folks from the Delta think uh, the staff and consultants haven't got right. But even if they had got all the data right, it's still a very difficult problem. The more detailed you get, you, this is an insoluble problem in this kind of study, which I've been exposed to at Yucca Mountain and on other projects of national interest. The more you try to chop a problem up and be more accurate as to the detail, uh, the greater the number of uncertainty terms that you introduce in your calculations. And the net result of that is that your median or best estimate drifts away from what in fact is the best estimate in reality, and it always goes on the high side. That was one of the problems with, uh, with dreams. Uh, I never expected that I would stand before anyone and praise dreams, which has a lot of flaws, but relative uh, to the DLIS, the dream study now doesn't look so bad. Just as an example of the uncertainty that you can see visually, since I forgot to bring my copy, uh, there is a figure later in the report, figure four point something something, that plots results from dreams against results from DLIS. And it's just like a scatter all over the, sh all over the place. You should look at that figure and ask yourself if this is a level of accuracy that's involved in both dreams and this tool, maybe there is a better way to do these things. Maybe we should be getting people together and using the best analog computer in the world, which is the human brain, to sort out these problems, rather than developing uh, an elaborate tool of, of uncertain accuracy. And so my, uh, I've done not a great job, but I've tried to step through the explanation of why trying to uh, develop a tool for prioritizing investments in delta levies on this very complex system is a fool's errand. I did that by attempting a sort of a short technical explanation. Uh, but, uh, uh, lest you don't want to go into that, lest your staff and consultants don't want to have serious discussions on that issue, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd give the layperson's response. Uh, you know, a lot of people these days think that government is being inefficient in addressing their needs, and I think this, this long misguided effort is a great example of that. And I'm throwing the bullshit flag. Thank you, Mr. Pike. Gil Casio. <laughs> well, I don't have a bullshit flag in my back pocket. <laughs> Hopefully, I have some meaningful comments. You can borrow Bob's. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't say I disagree with him, that's for sure. Uh, before I, um, let's, uh, let me introduce, uh, introduce myself. I'm Gilbert Cosio with MBK Engineers. Uh, we are the Reclamation District Engineers for 33 districts in the Delta and Sisun Marsh and I've been involved with levies for over 30 years. Um, before I get into my comments, I wanted to address a little bit of the discussion that went on earlier in the meeting here regarding the um, issue with the, the subventions program providing funding to the entire uh, primary zone of the Delta and not prioritizing fundings. That's not quite true. Uh, the first reason is, is that the subventions program is um, governed by section 12980 to 12995 of the Water Code. And specifically in, in section 12981, it says that your charge, you subventions program, you flood protection board, is to maintain the delta in its current state. So we've got to fund all these levies. So the question does come up, and it has come up over the years, because the way these regulations were drafted, we didn't know where we were going in 1988, so we drafted a short set of regulations, and then we added over about three years a different addenda and those, those held until about 2007 when the laws were changing and stuff. And so 
uh, was determined that we needed uh, updated guidelines, so we, we revised them in 2007, 2011, and now 2016. And in those guidelines, it does have prioritization language, and it does prioritize all the costs. The first two priorities that don't get funded too often are um, projects that, that you direct, the Flood Protection Board directs, which I don't know if you've ever done that. And the second priority is, is projects that Fish and Wildlife and I'll go into my, in my discussion later why they're involved. They direct, and there aren't too many of those. The third priority, which is usually the first priority in most years, is that the first $20,000 per mile is just for maintenance. We don't want the rich to get richer in this program. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to maintain their levy. So that first $20,000, and if you think about it, um, that's about all we really do in the Delta because the average levy district's about 12 miles, and so 20,000 is about $240,000. The average Delta levy claim every year is about $300,000. So we don't go out and build these gigantic projects. We, we get a lot done for the money we have, but it takes us several years. That's why we have to plan our work over a number of years. And so after that priority, which is about, you know, funds most of the work, then you can start funding the rest of the priorities. The, the next priority is, uh, is pretty large. It's up to Bulletin 192.82, so we do have uh, the ability to do that. The problem is we don't have the ability to cost share that much work. And certainly there are some levy districts out there, you can count them on one hand, that have a lot more money, but then they're limited to taking all of our money because after you spend $100,000 per mile, you get such a low priority, there's never going to be, and I don't know if there ever has been any funding left after that. So there's kind of a self-regulating uh, aspect to prioritization. It's just not as specific as what you, the council is trying to draft up. So it's, it's worked real well, and everybody's got to participate. It's, it, like I said, it's self-regulating. So as far as ability to pay, if we had more of ability to pay at 75% funding, there's no reason not to do more, but we can't. We've been limited just because of the finan finances of reclamation districts to a, a total of about $15 million of state funding per year is our cap. That's about all we can do under the subventions program. So. I haven't even started my comments. I'm getting beeped already. So I just want to address that because it is kind of covered. One, it's the law. They have to do it. And two, we have tried to regulate the priorities by setting up uh, different priorities. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, one, I appreciate the fact that the council has invited Delta Interests in to talk to your consultants and your staff about what we do so they could try to get information correct. Um, the problem we're seeing now, I, I kind of echo Regine's comments, is that uh, we're kind of going down this garbage in, garbage out road. I was on the, Dream, uh, was on the DREAMS uh, Technical Advisory and Steering Committees 10 years ago, and the, I saw the same thing happening. They, they got their technical information together, and suddenly when the information that went into that was not correct. And Regine um, talked about some of the assets that are, that are incorrect. We've looked at most of our levy districts, and, and they all have problems. Um, but what I want to focus on is the beneficiaries that, that um, was presented, I think, at your July meeting. And it talked about the, the levies that protect water quality, water supply, habitat, that sort of thing. One of the problems we have with what your staff has been given as directions is that they can only use published reports to establish what those beneficiaries and priorities are. And we find that to be a problem because a lot of the information out there is not published or could be developed if you guys did some more work. In the case in point, are the levees that are important to water quality and water supply. So what you've got essentially are the eight western islands, which have been established from long ago, and then the uh, Old and Middle River Corridor, which is more of a recent uh, water supply concern. The problem I have with that is that the one time a levee broke and heavily impacted water quality was in 1972 when Brandon Anders failed. So Brandon Anders failed in June of 72, the state had to dump 500,000 acre feet of water to push that salt back to keep it from getting in the central delta. Yet Brandon Andrus is not one of those levy districts that's important to water quality in your staff report from last month. And I don't know about you, but if it happened before and it happens again in the same thing, it's a big problem, then it should be in there as one of the beneficiaries of, of uh, the water quality and, and water supply. And so I would urge you, similar to what the Contra Costa Water District did in the letter to you, is incorporate some hydrodynamic modeling because you can't just start pulling levees out and thinking, oh, this one's too far away from the Western Delta to have an impact because they're all linked together. They're all one system. And one of the issues I have is that 
there have been reports, and I don't, haven't seen the studies, that say certain levees should be, remain open water if they flood. I would, I would ask you to look at your own, you know, get your own hydrodynamic modeling, look at what happens when those levees fail. Is that true or not? I sense that it isn't based on some of the information I've seen, which results of unpublished uh, hydrodynamic modeling report. So <clears throat> just keep that in mind, that, that I think you're falling short, and there's an obvious uh, problem out there with the Brandon Andrus levy. So I want to just talk briefly about the levy programs. I, I don't want to take up too much time in, in general. So we've got um, this requirement for co-equal goals. And everybody in multi-benefit projects, and everybody assumes that means every project has to have some sort of environmental benefit. Well, the levies program actually incorporated this thought, you know, back in 1988 when it was, it was enhanced through uh, SB 34, except it wasn't forced on every project. It was programmatic. So in 88, we were required to have no net long-term loss of habitat, so all of our work had to be approved by Fish and Game. In 1996, that changed to require an enhancement of habitat. And so how did, how did we comply with this enhancement without forcing every project to have multi-benefits or ecosystem? Well, one uh, was cooperation. We sat down, um, Secretary of Resources realized that Fish and Game and DWR are two departments under that position we're going to have to get together, so they formed the Delta Levees Habitat Advisory Committee. And that committee still meets today, and we hash out some of these questions that come out. And so the cooperation came out that the first thing we were going to do was get together a fishing game and, and write a routine maintenance agreement. How are you going to maintain these levees? And because of that, and in, in addition, we have um, programmatic vegetation projects and mitigation banks. We've maintained the enhancement of, of habitat as was required with AB 360. And to give you an example, and I, I don't... It's, it's a state plan of flood control levees. I hope the Flood Protection Board doesn't cringe, but I was just going over habitat uh, numbers with a staff person this week on, on a state plan of flood control levy. Their first assess assessment was in 1999, and their last one was in 2014. And so based on the two, um, the riparian forest has increased 50% on this district. I'm not, I'm not too happy about having more trees, but they grew because of the way we changed our maintenance. What's even more glaring is that the scrub shrub has gone up four times. It went from like seven acres to almost 30 acres, so from 1999 to 2014. And on the freshwater mar marsh, the tulies and inter intertidal habitat has gone up three times. So through cooperation, <laughs> these programs have been able to work on a programmatic level and not be forced or blackmailed into, into having habitat tied to every, every project. You know, what it takes is a lot of cooperation. A study like this is going to force us to do something that I don't think is going to produce what you think is going to produce because most levy districts are not going to buy into that. We have money. If, if we can't get the state money, it'll just mean we maintain our, our levy a little bit less and it'll take longer to implement projects. But to be t told that you have to include things in a certain way or else you don't get any money, I don't think that's going to work. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, I've got a few more things, but I'm taking way too much time. But if you have any questions, I would appreciate it. Thanks, Gil. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Final speaker is Gilbert LeBray. doesn't look like I, I, I know I'm speaking for Gilbert Libri because okay. I actually my name's Emily Papalardo um, I actually performed a similar risk analysis for Brandon Andrus levy maintenance district in 2014 for my UC Davis master's thesis and I, it was titled the importance of levy performance and the reduction and evaluation of risk in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta I found through that report that there was substantial uncertainty in the development of the levy fragility and stage reoccurrence data. Excuse me, could you, I'm sorry, I, oh. I missed your name. Emily Papalardo. Thank you. I work for Gill, and um, so we're, we're representing uh, Brandon Andrews Levy Maintenance District, RD 554-38002 and 556. Thank you, Emily. So, and um, to continue, um, 
Needless to say, the conclusion in the annual probability of failure analysis between my thesis and that of the DLIS is different because of the amount of uncertainty. While the DLIS intends to create an objective tool for which to base levy investment decisions, there are many subjective decisions that need to be made within that process, and that can alter the outcomes. Uncertainties can be reduced by using the best available data. We think an opportunity was missed in the DLIS process by not getting data from the district engineers because they have so much experience they've, and so much data, I think, that was missing. Um, and, and for example, the DLIS uses the concept of the weakest link, which I also used in my thesis. But it fails to actually identify the weakest link in the district's levies. The report takes the weakest link or the, and bases it off of levy geometry generally, but yet it averages the levy crown height over the entire district to develop the fragility curves. This is contradictory. The districts have soil data and know their weakest links. Um, it is important to perform a risk analysis for, of levies within the Delta to determine where best to appropriate state funds. However, the process is flawed due to a lack of on-the-ground expertise that the district engineers can provide. I don't believe anyone to be as knowledgeable about any particular island as those engineers that have worked on them for decades. Uh, while your request for a review of this methodology is appreciated, it is a bit late in the process and clearly lacks local input. The footers in the document we received all say risk analysis, analysis methodology July 20, 2016 final. We would like to formally request that the overtures made to district engineers early on in this methodology pro development process to actively seek input from those individuals that have first-hand knowledge of the Delta Islands, namely the LMA representatives, be honored. This has not happened, in our opinion, with any real acknowledgement in the document of the information received. Consequently, the local involvement input needs to be an integral part of the DSC and CVFPB working group that is being proposed for incorporation into the Arcadis fine-tuning process as it moves to a conclusion and issuance of a final report. That then becomes a key DST in Sacramento budgeting circles. Any questions? Um, Ms. Suarez? That last part, I, um, can you restate clearly what it is that you would like? The we would like group? to be involved in the working group proce process moving forward. I think you're going to have two people from each Central Valley Flood Protection Board and the Stewardship Council. Involved in, in what fashion? In, in kind of working on this, on getting moving forward with the Delta Levy Investment Strategy. Uh, that's what the, it said at the bottom of the agenda, that that was going to be created, a working group. Yes, we, we intended that the um, members, the two members and the uh, staffs of both bodies um, uh, get together and, and uh, work on items of mutual concern. And I guess your request is that, that, that meet those meetings mm -hmm. um, be open to the public and uh, you be allowed to participate. Is that or what you're saying? Or maybe you could just select several district engineers to participate in it because I think we all have the same concerns. Well, I th as I envisioned a group, it's very issue specific. So I'm still mm -hmm. trying to determine what is it the issue that you would like this group to consider? I think it's the issue is just the lack of, I think, of uh, data used in the de Delta investment strategy that the district engineers have. Um, Emily, you, you don't have to wait for a uh, subcommittee or uh, a group designated from these two entities. You have two gentlemen at the table here who would welcome your input in, in interacting with you. We have a technical pool of experts that they have been drawing upon to, to help them to develop this database and to make sure that the information that's included is as accurate and up-to-date as possible. So um, I, I don't know if they have talked to the reclamation district engineer on a particular island that, or island that you are involved with, but they would welcome that input. So um, don't wait. 
I would just like to okay. say uh, we have been meeting with Gil Abri and we actually have another meeting set up with him next week. Um, but we, we do always welcome additional input and um, all comments. And as you know, we've been trying to present our results and every th update as we move forward monthly at the council meeting. So hopefully there's been several opportunities to participate. Thank you. We, we have. Uh, I know we've, we've, we've put in input. We just, I think just in reviewing the methodology, we didn't see a lot of that reflected. So maybe moving forward, we'll just keep working with the group. I, I would encourage you to do Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, does that conclude all the requests? We do. How about if we uh, take a 10-minute break? Sounds good. Okay. We are now in recess for 10 minutes. What are we going to do for this? <laughs>Provides an opportunity for board members and council members to um, discuss anything they wish before we uh, talk about next steps. Are there any, um, anyone wish to comment? Uh, Susan? Thank you to Eric and Leslie and Dan and, and Dustin for this excellent work. The, the, the briefing material is very useful. I have some questions in um, attachment one on page 14, uh, starting at line <coughs> uh, 25. And I think Gil Cosio brought this up. There's a, an updated bulletin 192.82, uh, and there seems to be a list, if I'm reading this correctly, of priority projects <coughs> in response to this water code section. And then on page 17, there is a, another list that a coalition to support Delta projects put together. Uh, so my question is, there seem to be various lists out there. Um, have we done an analysis comparison of the list and then how that compares to some of the uh, different outputs from the investment strategy tool? We have been looking at the different you know, material that's been available and what other efforts have generated in terms of um, you know, feasible projects and wish lists. The problem that we're going to get to, unfortunately, is we're not going to have the scope and ability to evaluate different projects within the tool as it is right now. It has the capability of it, but we're not going to have enough information to weigh projects against each other. So what we're looking at right now in terms of informing a strategy development is are what are the current risks out there based off the information that we were you know, able to gather. If there were projects on some of these lists that had been implemented, you know, since uh, some of the source of data that we were using, then we would try to account for that in terms of reflecting that in the risk of, you know, actually being lower if one of these projects was actually accomplished. Say, for example, a bulletin 192.82 levy was actually constructed, then within our strategy, the way we would account for that is by lowering the risk to a specific state assets. Um, say, for example, if there was a project that was done on one of the eight western islands, uh, bringing a levy up to one of these geometry standards, then we would reflect that and show that the risk, for example, to water supply would be lower. And so that's how we would account for it in terms of prioritizations and strategy development. Um, and on the, on the history of funding, the subventions and, and other programs, let me find my note here. Um, on page 16, the, the paragraph at the top, um, there's a sentence that the 
Council has also heard from stakeholders in the Delta that estimates for levy improvements published in earlier reports are too pessimistic and that funding made available through Propositions 1E e and 84 has helped significantly with levy improvements in recent years. So that, that sentence leaves me wondering, um, the subventions program has been working very well. We've been hearing that, that uh, the risk of failure on many of the levies has been reduced. Uh, this paragraph tells me that we've been too pessimistic. So is that meaning that in the future, less funding will be needed? Well, I, th I think what we've, one of, the, one of the ways that our interactions with the RD engineers has been very helpful is they've helped us update information that was available from other sources to account for levy improvements that have been made uh, in the last few years. And also to better understand their um, estimates of what it would cost to improve levies. They've got a lot of experience and so they've helped bring that to bear. I think what we're seeing from that work is that the kind of lower bound of improvement costs that might be required in the Delta isn't as high as we had, had, would have thought when we, we, used, we cited these earlier uh, data to put this spreadsheet together. So it could be the costs of improvement aren't so great. Um, the availability, the avail whether the funds are available are sufficient to significantly, you know, pursue those improvements. I think we still need to, you know, get your feedback on. Obviously, to the extent that funds are spent on maintenance, uh, those are funds that are then no longer available for improvement. And we've got a limited amount of money. Uh, we're lucky in the Delta we have funds remaining uncommitted, unspoken for from uh, Prop uh, 1 that I think can provide, you know, an ample uh, down payment on the next round of levy improvements. So I think that's the good thing. And then the question is, well, what priorities would you count the council set for where those should be spent? And how does maintenance stack up against improvement as we think about priorities for using that limited amount of money? So I'm curious, in the past when, for example, the subventions program, uh, well, has there ever been an instance that it has run out of funding? Yes? So in that case, how were the um, priorities set? Well, the, uh, and maybe this is a question we want to th think through in more detail when we've got uh, the recommendation, the uh, discussion draft in front of us and DWR available at the table to help us. but. In general, under the current rule, the current guidelines that the Flood Board has adopted, my understanding is that the first priority is maintenance. So if all the maintenance is funded, then that people are seeking reimbursement for, if that's funded and the fish and wildlife commitments that are available, that are required to kind of go along with that are funded, then funds are available for improvements. If you look back over the, and improvements through the subventions program, if you look back through the recent funding history, in uh, many years, uh, no substantial funds are invested in major rehabilitation and improvement of the levies through the subventions program. Almost all the money is gone for maintenance because there's a high demand for it. Uh, there is in not a few years, there's a kind of a backlog of unfunded improvement projects, major rehabilitation projects that sought funds through the subvention program and then sufficient dollars weren't available. In the Delta, we've got another pot of money, the Special Projects Program, which doesn't get reviewed by the Flood Board. It has more flexible rules that's focused on, in recent years, on improvements to the Western Islands, for example. And so it's a complicated mix of priorities that the Flood Board establishes through its guidelines, the priorities that are established through the Special Projects Program, um, and then, of course, the urban and other levy programs that the Flood Board and DWR control more directly. Mary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to thank the Flood Board and their staff for participating in this meeting.
it's valuable to, to learn from each other and hear what we're hearing in our own meetings directly and cross-sharing that, that information uh, collaterally and collaboratively. I wanted to highlight uh, on page 16 and 17 two items for, for the public and for the flood board members to be aware of. Um, we get a lot of material to read. We're not always quite sure what the highlights are. Uh, this is, begins at line 20 regarding the Delta Protection Commission. And it reads from the staff report, the Delta Protection Commission's Economic Sustainability Plan for the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta issued in 2012 concluded that large investments in strengthening all of the Delta levees are a cost-effective approach to not only improving water supply reliability, but also economic sustainability and reliable energy transportation and water infrastructure throughout the state. The report states that the levee system is the foundation on which the entire Delta economy is built. The Economic Sustainability Plan, or the ESP, included several specific proposals regarding investments, and that's, those are reflected in Table 5, which is on page 17. Um, secondly, the, at the bottom of page 17, to recognize the work of the Coalition to Support Delta Projects, which was a verse, uh, ex ex excuse me, extremely diverse group of stakeholders in Delta interests, export interests coming together to create um, and environmental communities, including Metropolitan Water District and other stakeholders, wrote Governor Brown recommending that state funding be used to improve levees to protect the Delta's publicly owned Western Islands, particularly Victoria and Woodward and Jones Tract to protect water and transportation infrastructure and critical islands such as Bethel and Bradford Islands in Hodgkiss Tract. The levy funding recommendations was part of a larger proposal that also sought funds for various water supply reliability and ecosystem enhancement projects. We heard earlier in presentations and discussion about the importance of stakeholders being at the table, the locals being at the table, and what the value of, of that interest and involvement and engagement is. We can learn from the locals and when we're making important decisions. Here's a great, again, extremely diverse group that came together with a list of projects that were mutually agreed upon, and yet there's been no action on them. And, and that hurts both the locals and the state interests when we could be directing and uh, trying to focus on ways that the team can work together better and finding the resources in order for them to do that. Mary, if I could just interject. I was a part of that. You did a great job, Randy. It was, it was easy to identify the, 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 the places where money should be spent, but the group broke down when it came to the limited amount of funds and how to prioritize it. That's, that's why it stalled. And that's why the work we're doing here is so difficult because of the limited funding. And we're, we're hoping that um, a, a portion of that page 16, 17 that you skipped over, the, the levy assessment district, mm -hmm. we're really hoping that the, the Protection Commission will come up with a path forward to spread the ability to pay uh, from other beneficiaries that currently aren't contributing quite as much. Well, and to move that forward, Randy, we even, the De Five Delta County Coalition worked with the initial group, um, the San Joaquin Valley Partnership, is that right? Um, the San Joaquin Valley Counties and came up with our own other list of mutually agreed upon uh, projects that, again, is lingering out there. And funding is going to be critical, but so is leadership. And I think we might have an opportunity there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, Susan's question basically uh, gets to the point of there are a lot of lists out here, but is anybody putting the list together? I, I think that's what one of the, the jobs were being done. Have you? We have tried to consider those as, as, you know, there's a lot of focus on the tool, but one of the things that the council has always made clear is that they're making decisions, <laughs> not a piece of software. And so uh, is one of the things that we're doing is we're thinking through, you know, what would be a discussion draft that they should consider is we have been looking at other, other sets of recommendations about here's what ought to occur and trying to make sure we're cognizant of how that's being dealt with in the uh, discussion draft that we put before the council or whether some, in some cases uh, some of the work that's called for in prior recommendations has been completed or largely completed and so we don't need to go back and do that. Um, and so I think we're trying to understand all of that, yeah. Okay, so th <clears throat> at least you have reviewed all those lists and in, in, uh, ascertained whether, you know, certain projects are on everybody's list and are at the top of the list and we're, we're looking at those projects as being high priority, I, I imagine. Think given the 
you know, large amount of data in the de Delta, I would never claim we've looked at all lists. But I hope, <laughs> I hope we've looked at the principal lists okay. and uh, understand basically what's recommended and what the status of them are. Bill, um, a question for the board that uh, has to do with the policy decision that we're likely going to be making. Um, Eric, in your uh, guideline report, you, you highlighted in part two uh, risk reduction. You referenced uh, the flood system begins at the rim dams all the way through the delta. Um, I, and, and a couple of the public comments touched on um, additional surface and groundwater storage and to enhance the flood system upstream. Uh, there was a reference to Paradise Cut. Uh, I, I believe that's uh, a reference to improving, improving the floodplain um, in the, on the San Joaquin system. Um, for us, in 1997, after the flood, there was uh, reports made, it was sort of a post-mortem of what happened, and it was identified that uh, one of the contributing factors to much of the flooding was the lack of channel capacity upstream. Uh, that, that report has been out there for 20 years, so I'm curious, has the flood board uh, done any work to address those recommendations? And is that something that we should be considering in our levy investment strategy work when we're making recommendations? <laughs> so, uh, I, I will take it. Oh, Joe, would you like please. To? <laughs> no, I, I defer to you. <laughs> I'm here to back you up. Um, the San Joaquin system, you know, the, the, the federal part of the San Joaquin system uh, was designed initially in the 50s and constructed in the 60s to a low level of protection because it was identified that it was protecting ag areas and they couldn't afford to build urban level of protection levees. So, the San Joaquin is going, it, it has less protection, and there's really no possibility of raising those channel capacities that you're talking about. And uh, the information I've recently been briefed on, the climate change information, indicates it's even worse. That the, where they originally were designed for uh, up to 50 year level of protection, these are the federal levies. Uh, it may be only 15-year level of protection <coughs> under uh, climate change conditions. And because of, I, I, don't know, I think we had 30-something failures or something like that, don't hold me, but it was more than 20 in uh, 1997, uh, that will happen again. But the thing was in 1997, those levies were all included under PL 8499 and the federal government paid the lion's share of rebuilding all those levees. Now they've decertified almost all of those levees as meeting PL 8499 standards. So when the next flood comes, which it definitely will because of the low level of protection provided by those levees, the state will not have PL 8499 to lean on to bring back to this minimal level. So the, the idea that we would somehow increase the channel capacities on the San Joaquin is just not going to happen. I want to piggyback on what Joe said. Um, it's one of our favorite places to talk about. We spent quite a bit of time talking about it four years ago, and I'm sure it'll come around again in the spring. Um, you know, said another way, the, that side of the system was plumbed for snow melt, not for rainfall events, especially rainfall and snow. It's very different than the Sacramento side. Um, and in, some, in most cases, the channel capacities, there are no channel capacities. There's partial pieces of a flood control project that was never finished. Um, it's a real hodgepodge, but that said, I think it's also a real opportunity. There's a lot of uh, land now that came out of that flood from 97 that has been um, restored, purchased. We are trying still, the Corps is trying still to take a couple of these out of the federal system um, that um, were, uh, it was clear after the flood, uh, they were not going to meet standards. And the hardest part of this has been institutionally, just 
making the change and doing what everybody has wanted to do now for almost 20 years. And we're trying to turn that corner just with the paper to make sure that it can go back to what it used to be. And that will allow some capacity to be expanded um, for the channels. And so there's opportunities, but when you get to the bottom on the Stockton side, that's where the Paradise Cut reference comes in. Mm -hmm. And so it's obviously one system in the end, and so we're trying to connect those dots. And the one thing we said in 2012 in the plan was to uh, fundamentally make sure we look at the bottom and start at the bottom, and that's why YOLO is so important on the Sacramento side, because everything comes to the bottom eventually. And so YOLO Bypass, Paradise Cut, all those areas were recommended as high priority areas to really focus on. And I think um, people have made a good attempt to do that. The people on the ground, the counties, the JPAs, DWR, the resource agencies, it's not fast, it's incremental, um, but hopefully it will continue to happen. And I think that um, the folks that were working on the regional plans and then DWR working on the basin-wide studies will see some evidence of that work in the plan that gets produced to us or introduced to the public at the end of the year. Good. But that's a very big topic, I think, because it's the thing that I think maybe makes the most sense, at least to me, that we want to do where we can is to expand the capacities because you get so much out of that, both for protection and also for the environment. Good. You know, this may be a good uh, segue to file item number seven, next steps. Okay. We've talked about uh, uh, providing uh, a couple of members of each uh, board council to consult with staff. Uh, it seems like uh, we've identified a few matters that uh, are worthy of a little more discussion. I think, I, I think that uh, goes without saying. I, I, we've had a number of members of the, since the agenda came out who, um, who've contacted Leslie. I'm only allowed to talk to one other board member, as you know, about <laughs> these items. But um, <coughs> uh, Leslie has talked to all the board members. I think they're, they would like to move forward with that. Um, It'll be her job to assign the, the people, but I, I think our experience in having these small working groups was good. A couple of um, examples of things that can be worked on are one is the subventions program that's come up a number of times. Um, issues, that, as you know, is uh, it's before the legislature. Um, uh, Senator Wolk had a, has a bill that's that's being done. We all ought to be aware of our positions on that and the administration's position and uh, work uh, toward a common goal on that it, as well as uh, things like cost sharing and, and so on. The thing that bothers me about the subventions program is that we've, we're faced with a, an issue of looking at si uh, the system outside the Delta and no other areas and, and probably just to get to a point here we we have um, policies and procedures put in place to uh, protect urban areas uh, and and from flooding from a 200 year event for the rural areas and the areas where there's small communities um, they can't afford that and we can't afford that so we're looking at uh, another way to deal with the flooding problems in rural areas and small small communities. And I think it's gonna be a different program. It's not gonna be fix all the levees in the Sutter Bypass and around all the Feather River and so on and protect the Sutter area. You can't do it, it's too expensive to protect Meridian and Nicholas and and uh, uh, Knight's Landing and all of these these small communities. In the San Joaquin area, we've, we've got little communities like Fireball that have to be, but they don't have a subventions program. They don't have a program that is dedicated to fixing their hot spots, maintaining their levees, and so on. And to a certain extent, the feedback we've had from the regional areas is that the rural areas and the small community needs a potpourri of programs that, de that the department has that they can access on an easy, reasonable basis based on guidelines and so on that would fix the hot spots along the levees or 
in the case of Fireball and Meridian and Nicholas may have to deal with ring levies or whatever, but it's a different solution than for Stockton or for Sacramento or for um, Yuba City. Uh, it's a much different solution. So that's kind of the dilemma we're facing here, but it seems to me that in the subventions program, um, everybody says it's been operating great, they, they love it, and that's the testimony you're, you're getting from everybody if it's a similar to the ones we've had. So in these programs that, are gonna, that the rural areas are gonna be able to access, they're gonna have to do it in a, a different way, a much more cost efficient way, and they, to be honest, won't have to hire engineers at $200,000 a study to justify what they wanna present. Uh, so it has to be different. It has to be dissimilar. So as we're going through these, the subventions program, I think we've got to at least um, recognize that there are other areas of the system that are uh, got their eyes focused on what we're going to be doing with the subventions program because they want to have it duplicated elsewhere. And so that's that's one of the dilemmas that we're facing. But I think that that would be one of the things that the group could could talk about. And the other uh, thing is, is, as we indicated this morning, the, the uh, levy, uh, the Delta levy investment strategy needs to be the same in the Delta plan as it is in the flood plan. And it has to be the same coming out of this Delta levy investment strategy that, that we're contemplating on this uh, 217 update. And, and we, we just need to work out any disconnects or, or little problems that will inevitably arise as we try to do that. And um, anyway, I, th I think there are a lot of different things that we can work on. So I, I think this is a good idea, and we ought to just leave it to the staff to, to put the details together for us. Okay. Uh, we agree. We will do that. Uh, in terms of next steps, is there anything else that we should consider? If not, then um, anyone wish to make a public comment? Seeing none, um, the Delta, the meeting of the Delta Stewardship Council is now adjourned. Without objection, the meeting of the Flood Board is adjourned. Nice job, Randy. Thank you.